Is it volume? Volume is fine. Your volume is terrible. All right. I'm hearing it okay. It might be on your end, Bernie. But people should I'm mute fine. their people should mute their uh, their. Um... Is there a little echo here? A little echo. Okay. We're on. We're in uh, uh, volume number four. Sorvera Banan. Page sixty-nine, which is Buster Bukhal of Part Two. In the previous in the previous year, we focused on the three prohibitions of Buster Bukhal of. Uh, you can't eat it. You can't cook it. You can't have a no. And the Gzeira mid Rabbanon, that you may not eat dairy right after eating meat. We talked about the sheet of waiting six hours versus three hours versus one hour. Now, we will focus on eating meat after dairy. So if you eat a piece of cheese, can you eat meat right after? And other types of separation between meat and dairy food, uh, in terms of uh, eating meat at, and cheese at one table. Also, the halachas related to bread. Can you bake uh, milachtik bread? Can you make fleshachtik bread? If you eat bread on on a basar dik asuda, can you yet use the same bread on a on a milk dik asuda? So, although we saw in the previous year that most posts can hold that one must wait a significant period of time when eating dairy after meat, depending on what the interpretation of misudasa lasudasa, right, from one week to the next, one held it was twenty four hours, the other held it was six hours, three hours. Here we explain the various shitas. The Gemara states in Chulin that eating meat after dairy, that you don't have to wait at all. You can eat meat right after dairy. Says the Gemara in Chulin, Dav Kofei, Om Rav Chizda, Ochal Basar, Osar Le'echol Gvina. But if you ate meat, you can't eat cheese afterwards. But if you eat Gvina, Mutar Le'echol Basar, the chur from the Gemara, it seems that you can eat meat immediately after you eat cheese, right? It would seem that the reason for the difference between the two cases is that the particular concerns discussed in the previous shur concerning eating dairy after meat, because you had either the shita of Rashi that you have lingering teeth in one's mouth or that the meat gets stuck in one's teeth, according to Ramban, they're not relevant in most cases of eating dairy. There's nothing... There's no taste, there's no, uh, not, nothing stuck between your teeth. Nevertheless, the Gemara in Chulin does indicate that one was wash one's hands and rinse one's mouth before eating meat after dairy. At least when eating meat from an animal rather than poultry. As it says in Chulin, Tana Igra Chamud Ravava. Igra, who was the father of Ravava, learned, Of Ugvina Nechon Bapikurin. Fowl and cheese can be eaten freely. We don't know yet what Apikurin means. What that means is that if you eat cheese uh, or any dairy product, you can eat chicken immediately after without washing your hands and without rinsing your mouth. But Rav Yitzchak prayed Rav Mesharshe Iklebe Rav Ashi. Rav Yitzchak visited the house of Rav Ashi. Isolate Gvina, Ocha. Rather than cheese, he ate it. Isolate Psara, Ocha. They brought him meat. Ocha Velo Moshe Yadi. He ate it and he didn't wash his hands. Unrelate. So they sent him, I, Vatani Igra, Chamud Ravaba, Oifu Gvina, Nechol Babikras, Ofu Gvina in Basra Gvina Lo. How could you eat meat right after the cheese without washing your hands? That which it says in the Gemara that you can do that without washing hands, it's only chicken, not meat. But that's only at night where you can't see your hands. You have to wash your hands. But in the daytime, you can see that there's no food remaining on your hands. So this rule doesn't apply. Ella, we're continuing on page seven. Ella be shamay oimri me kaneach. 
Beishamai says that you wipe your mouth and you have to rinse your mouth. You have to wash your hands and rinse your mouth. He says the same thing. And you all, you can put anything in your mouth to wipe your mouth. Wiping the mouth was like you take a piece of cracker, you take a piece of bread, and you eat it. And that sort of wipes the mouth. The only, and you could use anything except for dates, flour, and vegetables. That's not very uh, rough. So it doesn't serve as uh, proper quinoa. So based on these gemoras, it seems that one must wash one's hands when eating meat from an animal at night without light and rinse and wipe one's mouth anytime. So that means when you eat a piece of cheese and at night, if you're eating meat, you have to wash your hands because you can't inspect your hands, it's too dark. So, and in every case, you have to wipe one's mouth. Question, question, Ernie. So is, is, is the Gemara actually making a distinction between chicken and meat here or not? Yes, it is. So why is it that... Make it right then, we, it's a low plug. The Xavier was made as a low plug, but the Gemara made a distinction between chicken and meat. So why in the, in the last week, and I'm, I don't know it wasn't last week, but I reviewed it, it didn't seem to be a distinction of waiting six hours or three hours, whatever, after chicken versus if someone ate, if someone ate the meat. We discussed it's a low plug. It's a low plug. It's a, the Xero was made low plug. Not to have any confusion between this kind of meat and that kind of meat. But they, by the way, that's eating meat and then how much you have to wait to eat cheese. That was one so deal. There, the, the shear was me sudasa le sudasa. Had to wait at least one suda. So there was machlokas what that month. The, the, the most stringent shear was 24 hours. The basic shear is if you eat noontime, your next suda won't be till 6 p.m., so it's six hours. But then we, we brought the sheet as of three hours, one hour, because in Europe, if you ate, uh, you know, since it comes early, light, night becomes early. So there, okay, anyways, that's, been, that's eating cheese after meat. And uh, and then there was no distinction between chicken and bus. Here, we're talking about the Gemara brought a case that regarding oath and gvina, you don't have to wait at all. And you don't have to do any washing your hands. You don't have to do anything. It means you eat a piece of cheese, you can eat chicken right away. And they made a distinction between oif in b'sara lo. But that's not our halach. Says the Shulchan Aruch, right, who also clarifies the halacha concerning poultry. The Shulchan says after eating cheese, you can eat meat right away. You just have to make sure there's nothing stuck on your hands. And I believe at night, when it's dark, you can't look at your hands, then at least you have to wash them. But there's no kinoa chapeh. Excuse me. So you have to wipe your mouth and rinse it. You have to wipe your mouth by eating something and rinsing it out. Like chew some bread. The kanech bo pivyof, that cleans out the mouth well. Or v'chein b'chol dabr shi'ir, so you could use a cracker. Chutz mekim chavitar miviyarka. Don't use flour, don't use dates, don't use vegetables. L'fish eim nidbokim b'chanichim. They stick to your cheeks. Ve'em akan chinyof, but they don't clean it properly. V'achar kach yadiach piv v'mayim obiyay. Then you rinse out your mouth, either with water or wine. These dinim lechatchila apply to meat of beef or deer, buffalo. Aval im bala echo psar ov achar gvina. If you're gonna eat chicken after cheese, ain't a tzarech lo kinoach velonet velonetim. So the Shulchan Aruch says you can eat chicken right away without any activity. 
according to the Sefer Kashrus, brushing one's teeth can also be done instead of using solid and liquid food. Right? Yesh Litzayin, Shalomavor Vedak Yitshuva, Ein Tzark Levoa Michael Shemekan But number one, if you're eating a cracker to clean out your mouth, you don't have to swallow it, you could spit it out. Shalok Adas Apri Toar, Hamuvaz Betchus Chetshuva Sham, Shemechot Kinoach Tzark Levoa Michael Shemekan Chibo. That's, there is a sheet that says you have to swallow it, but our psak is you don't have to. The Kamuvan, Shetzich Tzuach Shinai Bi Sodiot, that brushing your teeth is kamo kishtifa vikinoach, that's certainly like wiping and rinsing. <coughs> From what we've learned so far, based on the Gmar and Shulchanach, it seems quite clear. The Beis Yosef, in his commentary on the tour, notes that the Tsar holds that one must wait even when eating meat after dairy, regardless of washing hands or rinsing one's mouth. That there's a, there's a period of time you've got to wait. Uh, up until now, it would seem that we learned that after you rinse your mouth and wipe your hand and wash your hands, you can eat meat right away. But the Beis Yosef is going to quote a Zohar that says there's an need of waiting. He also pr- quotes the practice of the Maram, who accepted by himself not to eat immediately after dairy, due to something that had occurred to him. Says the Beis Yosef, don't eat it one meal, but the people who eat uh, cheese and meat in one meal, or one hour, or one meal, are born are born yomin uh, the person saw an image of a of a goat roasted, sort of uh, with the appearance of a person. The gabinun de la ela, the siyata misamim mit karvin bade, and that will identify angels that will attack him. This is again kabbalistic. The gorim le isra dinim be alma di al kadish. And will cause judgment to be aroused. So, Ukfar Katavti Mordechai, Shemaharam, the Marami Rottenberg, right? Marami Rottenberg, an early, the main, uh, the main uh, German posate who, who was held ransom and died in captivity, and a wealthy Jew ransomed them, his body, and they're buried next to each other in worms. And the Marami Rothenberg is quoted by all the Ashkenazi Poskin. He also avoided eating it right away. Because once he found a piece of cheese still stuck in his teeth. So because of that, he was machmer on himself. It's not he's adding to the Talmud who permitted it. The Beit Yosef comments that the Maram lived before the Sefer Zohar because the Sefer Zohar was published in 1350 in Provence, uh, upper part of Spain, lower part of France. And yes, there's a Masor that it came from Rosh Ben Yochai, but it was not published and available widely until after the Marami Rottenberg's death. So that's why. Uh, the Beis Yosef clearly states that remember the Beis Yosef was a Kabbalist, lived in Svan in 1500, so he knew the he knew this history of the Sefer Zohar. So he says, He says he was machaving to the Zohar because of a, a Maisa Shahaya. He was makel by Shnayl of Sefer Zohar. So Chaim, Meikar Adin, Shulchanach said very clearly that uh, you don't have to wait anything after Oath. But because of this Beis Yosef and the Zohar, that apparently any kind of uh, eating it right after cheese is something to be avoided.
So, but the Shulchan Aruch did not quote the Zohar or the practice of the Maram. So Rav Ovadi Yosef rules that Sephardim do not wait at all before eating meat. They can eat right away. That means after you do kinuah chapeh and after you wash your hands. We Ashkenazim who uh, follow the Marami Rottenberg, so we do machmi regarding where there's a little bit of waiting. When I was growing up, I was told to wait two minutes. Uh, when we, in Hillel, we were always taught to wait two minutes uh, after eating sheets. From and the after Helmstra? doing the kinuah. Was, yeah. the Helms truck? was that from the Helms truck or anything? <laughs> <laughs> well, only the LA people can laugh at that. Right. No, but uh, did, I, didn't you, did anybody ever else remember that sheer of two minutes? No? I like, thought I made it Sydney. up. <laughs> you, I see. <laughs> so says the Abi Omer. I wrote to Lech Shachagvina. So he wants to eat meat after cheese. I am all of lamtin bein tayim. You have to wait it all. Kidin alechol givin achar baser or ain't sark lamtin klal. So says the says uh, the Ovadia Yosef. Maskona de dina shemikra din mutra lechol baser achar vina laachar she kanech piv bepas vechiyotzebo viadich piv bemarshkim. Right? You have to chew on something, rinse your mouth out, be itol yodik, wash your hands, or inak yol sametev, or you know, clean them well. So let's say somebody was keeping some kind of minag where they waited an hour or more. Because remember, the Zohar used the word an hour. If, and he was doing it for some reason, something came up where it has to be mavatal this. Yasa Hatara. He has to have Hatara Snodorin. Ashlomer Mitchila Shunoi Ken Blinebe. Vazye Mutulo Lecho Bosra Hagvina. Abomisha Nor Ken Lefisha Hosh of Shikena Din Lesra Hilas Bosra Hagvina. Let's say he, he, he didn't know the din. He wasn't doing it because of Midas Hasidus. He just didn't know that there was no Isser. He didn't Gvina Hrabos. Yakulavatel Minogo Bliatar Plow. If obviously he's informed of what the real Allah is, he can, he can, he can break the minute completely. Without any way. Now, for us, Ashkenazim, the Ramah does cite the custom to wait after eating dairy approvingly, specifically after eating hard cheese. And we're going to tonight have a long discussion what that means. We don't eat him after, uh, we don't eat chicken after. Says the Ramah. And those people who are makol, you don't have to protest. You can allow them to continue doing it. So those of us who have a minute to be makol, should be makel. You don't have to wait at all. You know, you should do kinoa chapeh, rinsing your mouth, washing your hands. But he ends up miu tov lahachmir. So although the Ramon only mentions waiting after hard cheese as the practical custom, some have the custom to wait either an hour, an hour half an hour after eating any type of dairy based on the Zohar quoted above. He brings the Sefer Kashros, Laws of Kashros, that mention both of that. The Shach also refers to the Zohar that also may be the reason why people have such a minute. It's unclear whether the shach was referred to waiting one hour after all dairy or only after hard cheese. So let's, so anyways, those are the various minogim. But how do we know it? The Mishnah Brua does not require any of this. And in fact, he does not even require reciting Birchus Amazon if, for example, you ate dairy and then meat afterwards and you don't have to recite uh, says the Mishnah Berurah, the Ein Tzarech Lapsik Berchas Amazon, Emeinu Ochel Gvina Kasha, Eli Kanech Piv Yafav Yadiach, and I, I assume because the Mishnah Berurah passes that way, that's why there's no minig in general by the Ashkenazim to wait a significant period of time uh, after eating cheese. Now, what about this issue about eating meat after hard cheese? First of all, what's the reason 
that the Ramo holds that one should wait before eating meat in this case. Because he said, in the same way, Timo Bigvina Achar Basar. So the Tas suggests that this follows Rashi, who holds that the reason that you wait after eating meat is because due to the taste in one's mouth that lingers. So although this may be applicable to hard cheese, which has a strong taste, the reason of the Rambam, that the reason we wait after eating meat, that meat in between the trees is considered halakhically significant, does not apply, as that is strongly concerning meat. Because we quoted a, a posuk, uh, but it doesn't hold by cheese. So let's see the Taz inside. Nir Laniyus Daiti. The Tama Ramam Shazachar Tik Reisha Simen Shabachilas Gvina Achar Basar. The reason we don't eat cheese after meat will be Shum Basar Shabena Shinayim. Abal according to Rashi's Tam Tam Shemoishech and Abasar Shabetel Loichbaslan. Ev Shaloi Merkan Bechol Gvina Less Isr Lachol Basar Achrav. So based on based on that shot, the Rambam's shot, there's no reason at all. Even by heart, she says the Taz. The Gamba Bosser Shabena Shimalavi Karina Be Bosser, he loved the Galilean Crow, Bosser Nevish, it wasn't for the Possum that told us that it's a problem. Shemhochi Big Vina Shabena Shem Lavi Gvina Cloud, because teeth, cheese found between your teeth, not called Vina. Well, the Tam Shes a hearty Shumi Shum Shuman, which is Shikas Rashi Pshita, Yesh Lesser Gamba Gvina Mutlet. Vina Mutlet is like Swiss cheese, which has holes in it, like wormy cheese, that's how they called it. Which had a very strong taste. It was wormy cheese. It was wormy cheese. That's how they made it. That's how they, they made put it. Maggots, they put worms in it. Right. So, how long must one wait after eating hard cheese um, before eating uh, meat? Right. There's a there's a typo here, which I have to let, send them an email on because. It should be how long must one wait after eating our cheese before eating meat? Because we're, we're in the sugi of eating meat after cheese. So we said regular cheese, we don't have to wait anything. Now we're saying after hard cheese, since according to Shitas Rashi, it's Moshiach Tam in your pet, so how long do you have to wait before you eat a piece of meat? If we treat it as equivalent to eating meat after dairy, then we would say that one should wait six hours. Or however long one usually waits between meat and dairy, like three hours if you're a German or one hour if you're Dutch. And that seems to be the opinion of the Ramah, who stated that one should wait after eating hard cheese in the same manner that one waits after eating meat. And that's how the Taz Paskins. Yesh machmirim, afil b'bosra achar gvina perush, lam tin shei shows. Ushir gvina kosher shazoch ramainu. So now, the Taz now gives us a criteria what's considered hard cheese. Cheese that's aged for six months. Oh, mutles Or it's cheese that has many holes in it, which I guess is a simon that it's been aged. Now we're going to see that this concept of aging could be seen in two different ways. Could be that the cheese was actually aged in the process of making the cheese in the factory. They aged it. We're going to see Parmesan cheese is aged for 10 months before it's sold. But then we're going to see that some people, for example, some cheese is maybe only aged for two months. So it wouldn't meet the, but then it's put in the refrigerator and it might sit there for seven months before they sell it. Yes. And we're going to see that we'll see some people will say that that's not considered hard cheese just because it, 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 it was able to be preserved for six months. So just keep that in mind. So the Taz says that cheese that is aged for six months, you need to wait six, if you eat it, before you eat meat, you gotta wait six hours. But the Shach seems to say that one hour is sufficient. Right? Remember we brought that the main shita even that the, the sheikh of the Ramah was that after you eat meat, you can eat uh, cheese after one hour. It's just we have various humrus that pr push it longer. Right? The Zohar used the language 
of Shaita or Sudosa, which is Lechora, the Shach wants to say that even the Zohar might mean that the waiting period is only one hour. Adkan Lashon Lishna the Zohar Parshish Mishpatim Hachi Mashma Ayin Shach. So practically, the Sefer Kashrus rules that Ashkenazim should wait six hours after eating hard cheese. But there are different opinions regarding Sephardic practice. Oyech Lekvina Kasha, this is the Sefer Kashrus. Vitzon Lecho Psari, Minak Bnei Ashkenaz, Lantin Shei Shos, Afil Lepnei Basar Of. Means even if you want to eat chicken, which we said, Lechorah was, the whole thing was a Chom Rebam. Minak Bnei Sephardic, is lahamtin shachas bilvad. Yesha meikal ayam below amton aklam. So regarding Sephardi, the Ben Yishchai rules that it depends on how long the cheese was aged for. And if it was aged for six months or more, you should wait six hours. If it was aged for less, then you can wait less time. Rav Ovadia holds that one need not wait at all for any hard cheese. Since the Shulchan Aruch did not mention the stringency, of course, the Svartim followed the Maran Shulchan Aruch, and the Rav Avadya always followed that. Now, there are some cases that are subject to dispute, even according to Ashkenazim. According to the Taz and the Shach, hard cheese is defined as cheese as aged for six months, or has similar characteristics to such cheese, like it has a strong and pungent taste, like, uh, uh, you know, Limburger, I don't even know if that's kosher, or Bleu, you know, uh, uh, yeah, blue cheese, blue cheese, Roquefort. Yeah, you know, Roquefort, yeah, Roquefort. Do they have Pierre. versions of these? Yeah. Pierre, they do. Okay. Do. Nevertheless, some Israeli poskin, such as the Shevet Alevi Rabozner, are stringent with regard to standard cheeses, commonly known as yellow cheese in Israel, right? Gvinat Sahu. Or, or though known as American cheese in the United States, that these two must be treated as hard cheeses, since some have been aged for over six months, and it's difficult to determine which one. So the Shevet Alevi says, Asher shol bin achilas basa achrei gvina, malucha, you eat meat after salted cheese, shadai lo avra lev bav chadashim, which has not been aged more than six months, hinei adu shashita sashas, yesh perek kol abasu lo imash, malachmer bezeh, not to be machmer, Right, the whole problem is because of the Zohar. That if it was either wormy or it was with rennet. He says like this. If you go into the super soul in Israel, everything is sold there. There's many cheeses. If you've ever been to a, a basic super salt, go to the back there, you can see 30 cheeses that they're ready to slice for you. Elishem pochos mivav chadoshim. Some are less than six months. Ve'elishem yoysim mivav chadoshim. Ve'ayel etzach l'zel luach zmanim atay na'asu. He says, you need a chart to tell you this is two months, this is six months. V'zeh bilti afshari. Al-kein aleinu la'achmir v'chol kashem. So he says, by all hard cheese, like think about it, cottage cheese, cream cheese, that we, that they're considering soft cheese. Yeah. And you know, even the cheeses we eat that are not aged for six months are relatively, relatively hard. That's right. So the beloved and Rosh Zaman took a similar approach. But Rav Zev Whiteman, Rabbi of the Tnuva Company who lives in our lunch food, argues that most of the cheeses on the shelf today do not qualify for the criteria of hard cheese according to most poski. Let's see Harav Weitzma. The Kevan Shizman of Shalos and Shalagvinos at Zerubos or Gilos. That means from the time that they cooked the regular yellow cheeses. Hamahavot Shmoni Machuz Mititzroch HaGvina Tatsuvot, which represent 80% of the yellow cheeses. And he gives you the brand names. Yushalayim, Tiran, Amek, Achuza, Gush Chalav. He says the 80% of these cheeses is ben chodesh l'chod shayim. The aging is one month to two months. He says, v'kach gam advinot ha-bulgariot ha-maluchot. 
the, the, the salted Bulgarian cheeses. Nira Shein ain't in the Shabbos Legvinas Koshas. He says most poskim do not hold that all these cheeses are hard. Hein vetem le kart le kart the criteria mufiim bachroinim. Hein vetem le le criteria mukubolim kayom. Vav sheish gvina shechaya madaf shlem bitnai kira ruchim. Even though he says some of these cheeses, their shelf long, their shelf lives are long. They mm -hmm. might be refrigerated. Maybe before they're eaten, six months. He says, "Sofek Just because of that, that they've been able to be preserved, so you can eat them even after six months. He says it's very difficult to say that they would be considered hard cheeses. It's the process of aging while they're refrigerated is very partial, very slow. Shisha Chadoshim, like I mentioned above. The whole often, Yesh Gvinot, Shalagabayan Lakula Amma, Yesh Gizaches, Kael Gvinot Kashav. He doesn't argue that there's certainly cheeses that have to be considered hard cheeses. But those are going to be Gvinot Miu Chadot. These are very specialized cheeses, Kael Mitsuyos Gambitvuna, excuse me, Bitnuva. He says Tnuva also sells these cheeses. In Kimki Ben Tayim, he says these hard cheeses that Tnuva markets have, do not have Mahadrin kashus yet. It's very high concentration of like hard dry matter. He says Parmesans are aged a year or more. The tamam yuchad min chazek bolech, and the pungent flavor gets stronger and stronger. The chosha gvina mityashenet yoter, more and more you age it. And a similar position is taken by many American poskim, such as Rav Aaron Kotner, Zichron Uvrach, and Rav Moshe Stern, which is cited in the Kitzur Shulchanach of Bas Bachal. According to them, standard American or yellow cheeses do not, I repeat, do not have the status of hard cheese. And what not, need not wait after eating it before eating meat. The inei gilu day da pin is far la nagot ha gon rabarin kotler. He says, Ernie, he Ernie. Seen, yes, Ernie. The, the big kasha was on pizza, on cheese on pizza. Right. What kind of cheese is that? That would be considered matzah. That's in this analysis that we've had so far, it would be considered uh, not hard cheese because Soft cheese. mozzarella is like these other yellow and cheeses that he described, 80%. That are not, you know, uh, that would fall under this category. I would say. He says, "Meiser b'bachur, shuzman lechol eitzel rabenu." A bachur ate was invited to eat by Rav Aaron Kotler. The kasher gishu lefun of bosser. So they, the Rav Aaron Kotler's wife, I guess, served me. Amra bachur shuachal gvina tzahuva. He said he had eaten yellow cheese. Va'otzer machilas bosser. Amra la rabenu said Rav Kotler. He said, our yellow cheese in America, he says, that does not count as the quote-unquote hard cheese that the Poskim talked about. Those of you who remember in your homes, our, our grandparents had those like, you know, a ribeisen. On Pesach, I remember they would ride the potato that way. And I guess they would grate cheese. Really hard cheese needs to be cut or grated with that kind of thing. So he says that kind. So Sydney mozzarella, you certainly would not. It's soft that you would not use a grating uh, implement. So Rabarn's, one of Rabarn's criteria would certainly not be met by mozzarella. He says this is also the position of the OU, which has a chart on its website dealing exactly which cheeses it believes are considered hard cheeses. He says, in, mess, in general, most of those are types of Swiss cheese, Parmesan, and cheddar. That the OU considers hard cheese, that if you ate them, you'd have to wait six hours, according to the, 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 the shitos that we brought that are machmir. So he, they bring from Rab Avram Gordimer, who I guess is the OU cheese expert, the shtach, explains that hard cheese is referenced by the Ramah means cheese, 
which is aged six months. Poskin note that after eating pungent, strong tasting cheeses, one should similarly wait before eating meat, regardless of the cheese's age. So it's not just dafka six months. If you eat a cheese that's got a very strong flavor, you'd have to wait. It is the position of the Oyus Poskim. We know who the Oyus Poskim are. It's Rav Belsky, Zichron of Rocha. He was certainly one of them. It's Rav Schachter, right? Ernie, let me ask you, is, is, that, is it the difference between if there's a difference between meat and cheese, hard cheese over here. In other words, meat, you only, some people only wait three hours. Would you still have to wait six hours of the hard cheese? No, so we brought the cheetahs. Remember we said, that there are those, according to the one opinion was, you should only wait the period of time that you wait after meat. So those people that wait three, only wait three. Those people that wait one, wait one. Those who eat six, wait six. We brought that. And remember, even the czar said, well, said, czar said, but the Ramos said the same amount of time that you do after eating meat. So whatever that shita, whatever that shear is for that person is lechora the, the shita that they would go go by. But, but maybe a hard cheese is is got a, a bigger chumrah even this, these very hard cheeses. You know, no, but it, we, we 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 read it tonight. We, we read it tonight. I, I understand. Yeah. But, We read it tonight that, it, that the, yes, there are those that are machmer six hours, but those based on their sheet of only where they're not certainly not going to wait. They wait the same period of time that they wait after eating uh, cheese. That's what the that's the language of the Ramo. Language of the Ramo is exactly how you treat it after eating meat. How long you have to wait? Cheese. He did, the Ramo didn't say like you say that there's more of a chumra by hard cheese. He said it's exactly like meat. So so so, in a, so the position. So the, of the, so the thing is, with, hello Ernie. What about yes. what about what about meat that has such a repugnant taste that it, it lasts more than six hours? It, it, do they would do we ever be a machmer the same way that cheese yes. such a repugnant taste yes, Rashi, because it's not the Rashi, we talked about two, two we talked about the two svaris Rashi and Rambam so so the Rambam was the teeth the meat between your teeth according to Rashi was the was the taste in your mouth. So if the taste went on more than six hours, according to the sheet of Rashi, we would wait. We'd have to wait until that okay. taste went away. No question about it. We, we brought that as well last week. Okay. So let's just finish the OU business. It is the position of the OU's posting that one need only wait between aged cheese and meat if the cheese of variety that it is intentionally aged in production, such as Parmesan, which must be aged in production at least 10 months, if you get, and, for example, the you know the F the Food and Drug, you know administration. If you're going to call a certain food a food, it meets certain criteria. So champagne, if you're going to market as champagne, it's got to come from a certain region. Same thing. If you're going to market something as parmesan, it's got to meet certain criteria. So this criteria has got to be aged at least ten months in order to have that that notation on it. And Emmental has to be aged in production at least six months. One need not wait after consuming non-aged cheese that is then incidentally aged on refrigerator shelves and exhibits the same texture and taste as it should exhibit in its non-aged state. So I think they all used, those persons said exactly the way it came out in our Moscona regarding that issue. That's according to this approach, cheeses that happen to have been out for six months don't, don't just necessarily qualify as hard cheeses. Rather, they must have been intentionally aged for that amount of time to qualify. Now, here, there's an important footnote here. Another important issue is whether the stringency of hard cheese applies if it is melted. According to the Yad Yehuda, melted hard cheese does not have the same status as regular hard cheese. Therefore, in his opinion, perhaps even unanimously accepted types of hard cheeses, such as Parmesan used on pizza and the like, may not require waiting the full amount of time. Nevertheless, the issue is complex, as later posts can dispute whether the agnude refers to cheese dissolved into the food, or even cheese melted on top of the food. So you see, it gets really complicated there. But, so Sydney, what you might have been referring to is the issue of people, you know, putting Parmesan on their on their pizza because there, the, you'd have the issue of of having that flavor. But again, according to the, the Yad Yehudu, says if it's melted, maybe you don't have the problem. 
Okay. Now, there's other separations between meat and dairy foods that we have to be careful about. In it, we're on page 78. In addition to the separations required between individuals' consumption of meat after dairy, where, where we just said, after dairy, do you have to wait? So it depends. If it, regular cheese, no. But if it's hard cheese, yes. One must also be careful to separate between dairy and meat foods themselves. So the Mishnah in Chulin states that one must be careful that meat and dairy foods don't come in contact with each other. Says the Mishnah in Chulin, You can put a piece of meat and cheese in a, in a cloth. As long as you make sure that you wrap each in its individual package so they don't touch each other. Now, if meat and dairy foods do touch one another by mistake, the Gemara and Chulin indicates that if they are cold, all you can do is rinse them off and they may be eaten. Says the Masech the Chulin, the Chinogezeb is my hobby, soinin bit soinin. The only problem we have when meat and cheese come in contact is with heat. The, the medium of heat causes bleos to move back and forth. So the, the flavor of the meat is going to go on the cheese. The flavor of the cheese is going to go on the meat. Then you have basar b'chal of magish. But a piece of cold cheese falls on a piece of cold steak. All you got to do is rinse both off and you can eat it. You don't do it l'chatchila, but if it happened to fall there, that's how you take care of it. That means, he, he says, you don't need, klipa means you have to shave off. We're going to see some of the dinim, if even with heat, some, certain types of heat or certain types of salting, meat and, beef and cheese next to each other, in order to eat the two pieces, you have to take a klipa off. You have to shave a little piece of off of where they touch. The rest of the piece can be eaten, uh, unless it's a fatty piece, unless it's shuman. Then you, a klipa won't be enough. It'll, be, it'll go into the whole piece. But if it's not fat, and yet, and we have a problem with that halacha, because we're, the, the post can say, well, we're we not mumcha, what's fatty and what's not. But meikra din, there's this concept of klipa. So Bai wants to tell us, you don't have to remove a klipa, but hadocha you must do. You have to rinse it at least. And that's how the shulchan of pastas. You can eat them. You have to wash it off where they touch. You can wrap them up in the same mitpachas. The shach cites the Bach that if the foods are dry when they touch, they don't require rinsing. So you only rinse them if they're moist. If they are dry, you don't even need to rinse it. The Mishnah also indicates that one may not place meat and dairy together on the table upon which a person is eating, but is permitted to place them on the table used for preparing food. Says the Mishnah, Meat you can't cook with milk. Fish can, can, can be cooked with dairy. And grasshopper meat, can be cooked with dairy. Of course, we Ashkenazim don't have a misora, so we don't eat chagovin. But the Sfardim, particularly in Morocco, they would eat the chagovin because they had a misora for that. So you may not bring cheese even up to the table. Except the the, you know, fish or grass. He says, Chicken, this is sort of not bringing meat up to the table where there's cheese that only applies to meat. It doesn't apply to chicken. You can't eat it, of course. Everybody should. Basil says, You can't bring cheese either. You can't bring chicken either. And on Rabbi Yossi, Zemi Kule Beisham Basil. This is one of the few examples where Beishama is more lenient because he lies to bring chicken up So all of these dinam of halal, can you bring the meat up, can you not, that's only up to the table you're eating. 
the prep table, the cooking table. They are not in Zebit Sad Zebe in a Choshe. And that's how the Shulchanach rules. A Philip Sarchaya the Oath, meat of a, of a Chaya and an Oath. Also, my Lord, so I'll Shulchan Shulch love Gvina. So he's machmir, not just any kind of regular meat, but even chaya and oath meat. You may not bring up to the table that you're eating cheese. Shaloyavul, that's a gzeira. Shaloyavul achlam yavah. Any, any. Yes. it sounds, it seems counterintuitive. You would think that uh, on the table that they're eating, because it's prepared already, so the thing's not going to splatter, it's not going to move around. But where you're preparing, you're going to, things can move. Things mm -hmm. are, you're preparing it. It doesn't, it seems really counterintuitive that, that you, on a prepared table, you could use basav chala. And on a regular table, no, this is also. So I, I well, you see, it has to do with the eating of it. See, we don't want you to eat the two together. So when you're eating on your table and you're eating cheese, if they bring a piece of meat there, they're concerned you're going to eat it together. You don't eat from the prep table. That's the shot. You prepare Ernie, what? the food there. Now, they don't Ernie, know what? the modern day cooks are always eating, but in general, there was not considered good form to eat from there. So that's why they weren't choishish. Eid Hanami, you're correct, because the splashing and all that, but they were concerned of eating it together. Because we, 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 we had the Gemara We had the Gamora and Brochus, where we said that when they came to a hotel, I think it was a hotel, the Gamora and Brochus said that basically you can have. One side is meat, one side is milk, and it's not a problem. We're, we're going we're gonna to have this tonight. <laughs> that, that you're, you remember that Gemara, and that Gemara is an important Gemara for our sugi here. So let, let's see how it goes. The Shach points out that this prohibition of halal applies only to Basu B'chala, but it is permitted to eat at a table that also has non-kosher food on it. Since we assume that most individuals will stay away from it. So... What that means is, and let's say you're in Disneyland and you sit down on a picnic table and some guy's eating a ham sandwich there. So that's not a problem because people are bedile mine. Kosher people will stay away from that. But since cheese is permitted and meat is permitted, we're not bedile from that. We don't stay away from that. So that's why if you're eating cheese, you can't bring meat on it. But you could, a non, but non kosher meat could be put on that table. There's no gzeira of hola. Because we stay away from that. So you see right. another riot that has to do with what, what, what concern of what people eat. Yes. Excuse me, Ernie. What, what happened if you would accidentally spill milk in a refrigerator on a meat dish? So if it's cold. <laughs> so if it's cold. <coughs> but it's liquid. If the liquid penetrates into the meat. So if it's liquid into a tough shell, then you have a problem. You know, if it's liquid into a shell. Now, but there are, there are ways you could... Uh, if they were cold, if you could separate it, you could separate it. You can't, if it's impossible to separate it, then it, then it's a, then it can't separate it. Well, that was a bit of bottle <laughs> Except if it's bottle bashishim, but that's only if it happened accidentally. You wouldn't be able to do it l'chatchila. And then there are some things you'd have to make an attempt to get rid of. We'll see, we'll see. We'll have, you'll have to make an attempt to get rid of it, even if there is bittel. There's still, if we know that there's something in there, and you have an ability to get rid of it, you might have to search after it. But Bernie, the answer to your question is, if, a piece, if in your refrigerator, something fell, let's say a piece of milk fell on a cold piece of steak, so you just rinse it off. Okay? Well, lach balach is different. We're talking about hard on hard. Let's, let's leave it, yavesh, yavesh, be yavesh. There's different dinim, whether it's lach biyavish, yavish balach, we'll get to all of it. There, I, as, if the serva covers covers all that, and if not, we'll add we'll add some of the details. There, but I'm sure those things come in in the halachas of taruvis. See, in the simonim, bosr b'cholav is, is going to deal with bosr b'cholav. Then later on in taruvis, we're going to have a lot of issues as well. Again, with milk and cheese, milk and cheese. That's why normally we le you learn bosr b'cholav before taruvis. Because it gets very complicated in Taruvis unless you know the Basar B'chol of Dinim very well. And a lot of what you've asked, Lach B'lach, Lach B'yav, it's not coming up here. It's going to come up later on when we learn Taruvis. Mixtures between different Isr Vehetar, kosher and non-kosher, but also milk falling into cheese and vice versa. We haven't really dealt with that here, but we will. But let's, so this, what we've dealt with here, like I, is the example I gave. 
cold piece of cheese falls on a cold piece of steak. You just rinse them off. That's yavish, but yavish, and it's got to be moist. If it's dry, you don't have to do you don't have to do that either. You don't have to do any rinsing. Says the shach. Like we said, people don't stay away from meat or cheese. They're both mutter. Well, the combination, that's a problem. Because you're going to stay away from that. So let's say you've got some kind of prohibited bread. So that people will not stay away from. So there'd be a pro- prohibition to bring that up as well. Now, Walter brought up the fo- It's very common nowadays to have food courts or other eating areas in public places in which both meat and dairy eat in the same area. Based on the shock, it would seem that eating, eating near other people or eating non-kosher is not always problematic. What about the question of eating meat at the same table at which someone else is dairy? According to the Mishnah, two individuals who know each other may not eat at the same table if one eats kosher dairy and the other eats kosher meat. This is in Chulah. Two innkeepers, two people staying at a hotel. Because they don't know each other. They're strangers. They're not going to share food from each other. So in that situation, you're going to be permitted. Now, the Gemara elaborates that the two individuals know each other. They're acquaintances. They are not permitted to eat meat and dairy at the same table since they may decide to share each other's food. When the Gemara told us, or the Mishnah told us, that you're not allowed to eat with somebody that you're allowed to eat one guy eating meat and the other guy eating dairy. You don't know them. They don't know each other. Because they're going to gonna eat from each other. Two guests are staying at a hotel. They don't know each other. One comes from the north, one comes from the south. One comes with a stick flesh and the other comes with this piece of cheese. They can each eat, you don't have to worry. When do we say it's prohibited? What's Tfisa Achas? In like one parcel. Who eats it out of one parcel? It means it's, when the diners are someone acquainted with each other, it's considered like one parcel. Tosfus explains in, the, in Tosfus' first explanation that if there's an item that separates between the two diners, a hacker, they are permitted to continue eating together. If they're eating on the same table and there's no something separating them, it's considered that it's tfisachas, and then there would be usr. But if something is separating between them, hechidami, something of medium-sized height between them, like a candelabra. So the Tosfos is talking about in their time, their minig was, um, if one guy's eating meat, one guy's eating cheese, they would put a piece of bread, or like a, 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 a jug, or shark kalim, or other kind of kli. Lafsik ben tayim. Here comes the kicker. Oy oichel al mapa acheres. Or they eat on a different mat. One is a milichtik mat, one's a fleishik mat. Different colored mat. Ke'en shtei tfisos. And that considers it like it's two tfisos, and that would permit you to do it. According to toast, this is a separation between the two diners will ensure that they do not eat from the other's food. This is also the ruling of Shulchan Aruch. And the Ramah will add some detail and we'll end our shir tonight with this Shulchan Aruch. Two people who know each other cannot be eating meat and cheese on the same table. 
אפילו הם מגבידים זה על זה. Even they don't like each other. But it doesn't make a difference. אבל אכסנועים שאין מכירים זה את זה, but let's say two people are staying in a hotel, they don't know each other, מותר. And אפילו המכירים, and even those that know each other, הם עשו שום הקר. If they make a, a simon, כגון שכל אחד או של המפה שלו, each one each on his own uh, uh, table map, או אפילו אוכלים על מפה אחת, even if they're eating on the same tablecloth, but no used to be named pas leker or another kli mutter. Says the Ramah, nafka shein ochlim in a pas hamunach b'neim leker. As long as they're not sharing from that piece of bread that they're using as a heker. Aval im ochlim imenu lo av heker. Im lavachia pas ochlim imenu munach al hashulchan. Even though it's there, aval im nospen b'neim kli shesoysim imen. Or let's say they're they're drinking from the same kind of vessel. It would also not serve as a good heker. However, if it's a kind of jug, even though they're drinking from it, but it's not normal for it to be there. So if all of a sudden you bring out some, you know, silver goblet that you would never bring out, so that, and even though they're drinking from the same place, the same goblet, uh, they would, that would be a heck. Right? It's just like a candelabra sitting there. That's clearly a heck. They shouldn't drink from one utensil, e- e- each one of them, because food gets stuck to the utensil and that's going to be a problem. The Taz writes that the object place is assigned, must be placed there with the purpose of being assigned rather than for some other reason. You'd have to, it has to be there, put placed on purpose. Because he says every table needs a lamp, so that would not be enough for a hacker. And the Pischei Tshuva, who lived about 100 years, lived in the mid-1800s, who gathered all the Shilas and Tshuvas uh, in Yordaya uh, up until his time, he lived 1850, 1860, so he's a huge source for, for Allah. Pischei Tshuva adds that if the two individuals are sitting at a distance from each other, such as one simply cannot take food from the other without standing and walking to him, then you don't need a hacker. Just the distance, the fact you have to get up to eat from him, that will serve as the hacker. Right? You can't just reach over and grab. And if no sign or reminder was placed on the table, Rabbi Kiva Eger states, that one may not request from another person to serve as a shomer, who will remind them that it is forbidden to share food. And the Yaakov Yosef agrees. As long as he eats on a different tablecloth, that's enough. Okay, we'll stop here. Uh, we'll have a little bit, uh, you know, we got a fair amount to finish. Uh, Hopefully we'll finish next week. By the way, there's a very interesting eon, um, uh, baking, you know, cooking things in the same oven, milk and meat, in terms of reicha milsahi, they don't really deal with zeya, so that'll come later. But it's a good introduction. If you have time, you know, the, the eon here after uh, this volume two. Uh, excuse me, after this part two, Bos so the Dafyomi people can learn Dafyomi now. Uh, tomorrow Dafyomi is going to be at 8 o'clock in the morning.